We get into our Bibles, and if you have your Bible there, turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 1 as we begin. Romans chapter 1, notice, if you will, verse 16, a great verse. Romans 1, 16. It says here, Paul says, I am not ashamed, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The word gospel is... Uh, an Anglo-Saxon word from the time of King James 11, and it means good news. And it says here, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ, for it is the power, the gospel that is, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, or the word in the Greek means to trust. When you trust Christ, that he died and shed his blood, was buried and rose again from the dead. When you trust that he paid for your sins by his death at the cross, God saves you. It's this wonderful message of the good news of the death of Baron Christ of uh, Christ that uh, brings about salvation. This is a great verse to mark because uh, it's not salvation by works or as we've been talking about baptism. Water baptism cannot save and does not save. And yet we baptize. And somebody said, well, if it doesn't save you, why do you baptize people? And we're going to be answering that question again today. But water baptism does not save you, nor does church membership and keeping the commandments and any number of things you might ask about. But it says in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This wonderful message works, by the way, all around the world with every people, every culture. And... Uh, Everybody in the human race, everybody that's a descendant of Adam needs to hear this message because unless they believe the gospel, they will be lost and uh, spend eternity in hell. Those that are seeking, I believe, will hear the gospel. Somebody God will bring along that has the gospel and uh, either bring them across their path or they'll come across uh, our path and we'll be able to share the uh, good news with them. You know, it's just remarkable how people are linked up by God. And we see it happen all the time. Chris and I were leaving the Gator game yesterday and we had to stop for gas. And the person at the pump across the way, he was starting to talk to them to give them a track. And they said, we come from a little place called Brandon. <laughs> and Chris said, I was born and raised in Brandon, in fact, in Snefner, Sefner. <laughs> and uh, interesting, I got the trade phone numbers and gave them the track, and interesting, that was probably not an accident, you know. Here you are way up in northern Florida, and, and somebody at the next pump is from where you're from. And the Lord allows these connections to take place, to be able to hook up with people that are seeking to hear the gospel. And I believe that if you're willing to share it, if you have a track ready or you're ready to open up your mouth, that God is going to bring people across your path that are ready to receive that track or receive that message. And it is uh, exciting to see that taking place. And it should be happening on a regular basis in your life if you're willing to share it. Of course, if you're keeping your mouth shut, then God is not going to bring people to, to talk to you if you're not going to open your mouth and tell them. But if you're willing to tell them, uh, they're uh, out there. We know that the classic example of salvation that God has given to us. The wonderful illustration he gave us was the cross itself. There were two thieves that were crucified, and one of them was saved, one of them was not. One of them was saved because he believed the gospel message. If you read the passage carefully, he believed that he was a sinner. He believed that Christ was sinless. He believed that Christ was going to die. He believed that Christ would come back from the dead and have a kingdom. And so he says, and Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he knew Christ was dying, dying to pay for sin, was going to be crucified and die and then come back again and have a kingdom. And he said, do Lord, remember me. What a great verse. And of course, he was saved. Christ said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You can imagine the other scenario. He could have said, well, you know, I'm sorry. Your heart is right. I can tell you want to be saved, but water, water baptism is necessary. Uh, how are we going to get you down off the cross and get you baptized and get you back up here and let you die on the cross? Not going to happen. 
Isn't that amazing? Think about it. When God gave that illustration, it was to really let us know how everybody who would ever be saved would be saved. And that is not by works, not by baptism, but by faith in the finished work of Christ as Savior. And water baptism, obviously, is a human work. And we talked about that last week where Christ said, Suffer me to John the Baptist or allow it to be so that we might fulfill all righteousness. That was a work of righteousness. And last week we covered Titus 3, 5, which says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to God's mercy, He saved us. We're saved by placing our faith in Christ. And it says, by the washing of regeneration, the, the washing, the cleansing that occurs when you are born again. Uh, you're cleansed of your sin, and it's not by water. But now we're going to go over to uh, Mark's Gospel for just a moment, as there are many more baptisms than just water baptism. And we find in Mark chapter 7, this one surprises people. In Mark chapter 7, it says in verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, oft eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, Mark 7 verse 4, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. Well, guess what? The word washing there, the word wash, come from the Greek word baptismos, the very same word that's translated baptize in every other place. Interesting. I was attending an Orthodox synagogue last year and they would always have a little uh, meal and before you could eat you had to go through the ceremonial washing and you had to take this cup and you poured water on your left hand and you had to do it three times and you poured water on the other hand and three times and and all this ritual that you had to follow before you could ever ever eat. Everybody was lined up to get in a line to, to do the ceremonial washing. Uh, wash, wash, wash. And uh, it was uh, something they did, just like we're reading right here. The Pharisees did that. It says, verse 3, except they wash their hands, eat not, and they would have the ceremonial washing. And verse 4, and when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they've received to hold as the washing or baptism of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. So I call this one the baptism of the pots and pans. Uh, this is really what it's saying. So next time you approach the sink and you're not too happy about having to wash the dishes, think of it as being a spiritual experience. <laughs> Announce to the family, I am now practicing baptism. I am now baptizing the pots and the pans. And uh, maybe they'll all want to gather around and watch. It's exciting. But really, technically, that's what the word means. When you wash your hands, you're baptizing your hands. When you wash the pots and the pans, you're baptizing the pots and the pans. The Greek word is the same. And somehow we have uh, a mystique about the word baptism that it's only uh, water baptism that we're talking about in the traditional sense of, of getting people baptized. And so many people feel like, well, I've already done that. Don't remember it, but I was an infant. They say they sprinkled me or something. And of course, uh, that doesn't uh, resemble also New Testament baptism where the believer was immersed in uh, water. But not to be saved, but because they were already saved. We're washed of our sins in the blood of Christ. Let me give you a wonderful, wonderful verse. And I love the hymn writer. This is Revelation chapter 1. But uh, the hymn writer wrote, What can wash away my sin? The answer is, the great hymn says, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. The hymn writer got it right. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ could wash away my sin. And so here we are in Revelation chapter 1. It's talking here about Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, and this letter to uh, us, the book of Revelation, is written by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are mentioned in verse 4 and 5. In verse 5 it says here, the second eternal member of the Godhead, and from Jesus Christ, this letter is being addressed to you and me. 
who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him, Jesus, that loved us and washed us from our sins, not in water, but notice what it says, but in his own blood. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It is the blood of Christ that washes away our sin. Water does not. And water baptism has nothing to do with salvation as far as acquiring it uh, or keeping it. It's something that we do as a testimonial of how we have been cleansed of our sin by the blood of Christ. The water is merely symbolic. It's a picture of what has taken place when you are cleansed of your sin by the blood of Christ. And that is, of course, the theme of the Bible wherever we look, that it was the blood of Christ that was shed at Calvary that washes away our sin. I hope you mark that verse down and keep it somewhere handy. But there are those who try to teach that water baptism is essential. And when you bring up the topic of the two thieves, as we just did, they'll say, well, that was Old Testament, doesn't count. They died in the Old Testament. Not true. Think about it. You know, when the thieves came in John's Gospel, uh, chapter uh, 19, uh, to speed up the crucifixion by breaking the legs, uh, we find that Christ was dead, and they didn't break his legs. And the Bible says that the Scripture was fulfilled, that not a bone in the Messiah's body would be broken. Wonderful. Because they were about ready to break the legs of Christ, but he was already dead, and so they didn't have to break his legs. That would speed up crucifixion, because if your legs are broken, you can't push up, and you had to push up for every breath, being suspended with your arms out. You can exhale, but not inhale. And so for every breath... They would push up until they finally became exhausted. And the person dying of crucifixion ultimately dies of suffocation. And here they came not as feeded up. And so they broke the th legs of the two thieves. But notice, Jesus was already dead. So if we take the, 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 the line, the timeline mark, Christ's death, they died which side? Before Christ died or after? They died after Christ died. And so I always like to say, hey, you can't say that because they died after Christ died. And they usually scramble to look because they don't believe it. They can't imagine that that's true. And sure enough, they died on the New Testament side of Christ's death, didn't they? So make a note of that because this is the objection that will come up because those who teach water baptism have a little uh, planned out message to bring you. And they have answers to some of these things. And they'll try to say uh, that they were Old Testament and now it's New Testament, as though the plan of salvation has changed. The plan of salvation has never changed. It's always been the same. No one has ever been saved by water baptism. No one has ever been saved by offering up animal sacrifices. Nobody has ever been saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. Nobody has ever been saved by any kind of human work. Everybody who's ever been saved has been saved the same way by simply trusting in Christ as Savior. You don't mean it. Yes, I do mean it. And the Bible does say it. Let's look over in the book of Acts, and you'll love this verse. And I love it, and I've used it before, but sometimes all of a sudden the light will click at some point, some sooner for some than others. But in Acts chapter 10, look at this wonderful verse. I love this because Peter, who is, the Scriptures tell us, unlearned, that means he didn't have a formal education, and he uh, was a fisherman by trade, here he is one of the best expositors of Scripture that there is. And how can this be? He is able to summarize for us better than any the entire Old Testament Let's take a look at it in verse 43. What a wonderful verse. I've used it before. One that is somewhat every believer ought to be familiar with. And here, notice, Peter says in Acts 10, 43, to him. The him in verse 43 is Jesus. Reminds me of the story of this young lady, and they asked her, why do you go to church all the time? She says, because of the hymns. The hymns? Yeah, him and him and him. 
Oh, that's a sidebar here. Here we are. Acts 10, you've probably found it, I hope. Page 1163, verse 43 of chapter 10 of Acts. To him, Jesus, or from the Hebrew, Yeshua, give all the prophets witness. That is a wonderful statement because it tells us that all the writers of the Old Testament, all the prophets, all spoke about Jesus. You know, I didn't know that in the church I was raised in. I wasn't told that Jesus was God. I wasn't told that Jesus was found in the Old Testament. I didn't know there were any prophecies about the coming of Jesus. I didn't know that. I got so excited when I saw that verse in Isaiah that said he'd be born of a virgin. And when I saw that one in Micah that he'd be born in Bethlehem. And I just said, wow, the Bible foretold all this beforehand about Jesus. And all the prophets spoke about Jesus in the Old Testament. That got me excited. I said, this, this to me, I equated real quickly, this has to be the Word of God. Only God could have told that in advance. And if you want to know about the future, don't go to the psychic. Go to God. Because God can tell us about the future. And, and of course, uh, we have a wonderful future laid out in this book, don't we? Because there's a great day coming when we'll all be with the Lord in heaven forever and ever and ever. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? It's going to be really quite remarkable. When you think about the senses we have right now and how we have uh, hearing and we have sight and sometimes we maybe just don't take time to think about how critical they are to us but uh, we use all of the senses in getting about every day but can you imagine when we get to heaven all the lights and sounds that we will hear and see and all of the senses that we will uh, have uh, heightened to their max and to enjoy all the beauty of heaven and all the sounds of heaven. Uh, it's going to be quite remarkable. It's going to be quite something. There's nothing on this earth that could even come close. And I know there's a lot of beautiful things we can see here in this world, but not as beautiful as what we'll see in heaven with all of our senses uh, lit up in a sense to all the things that God has to, uh, to uh, have us hear and see and experience. Well, here it says, To Jesus, to Yeshua, give all the prophets witness that through his name, Jesus in English, Yeshua in the Hebrew, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. What does it say? It's saying here that the Old Testament prophets all the way through out from Genesis till Malachi taught Salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Isn't that a great statement? This is a summary verse. You need to make note of that. Peter is saying that all the prophets gave witness that the plan of salvation is the same, that whosoever believeth in him, in Yeshua, in his name, Jesus, shall receive the remission of their sins. That is, that's a great verse. I don't know what you can do to, to make it stand out in your Bible, but my goodness, we need to maybe draw an extra arrow or, or do something. I remember uh, when I first began to mark my Bible, if a verse was really outstanding in my mind, uh, to me, impressed me, I would draw a great big arrow pointed to it and highlight it with some color and really try to make that thing stand out. And uh, here, this is one of those great ones. So the plan of salvation has always been the same. Nobody was ever saved by any other means than just by faith alone. And if water then all of a sudden became a requirement, wouldn't that mean that the plan of salvation changed? And some people believe that. They believe that they were saved in the Old Testament by offering up animal sacrifices. And all of a sudden that ended. And now what's the latest new plan of salvation coming on? Ready? Here we go. Now it's get it under the water and get water baptized. Look at Hebrews now, chapter 10. To your right, Hebrews chapter 10. And I don't know how you write things down, but uh, make notes on some of these things because I believe that when we're in church as we are right now, that this is like a learning session, a training session, where you're getting prepared so you can answer for somebody else. Can you imagine somebody you might talk to that might have this very question that's going to come up, and later you're going to say, oh my goodness, he just covered it last week. 
And I was asleep at the switch. I didn't write it down. I thought I would, but I was too lazy. And, and, and you don't have the answer. Well, this is what this is all about. When you're here in church, this is like, get ready for the exam. The exam is actually when you're talking to that person, that family member, that relative, or somebody that needs to know how to be saved, and you're ready to go with the answer. Look, if you will, in verse 4 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, where it says, For it is not possible... Page 1300. It is not possible. That means it's impossible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. That's pretty plain, isn't it? It's not possible. It's not possible. That's why Jesus came. Look, if you will, chapter 9, verse 12. What a great verse this one is. Hebrews 9, 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his what? His own blood. His own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's why Christ came and died. It required Christ's blood. There was no animal you could sacrifice. You could sacrifice animals all day long, all of your life, and still not have one sin forgiven. Because it's only the blood of Christ that could wash away your sin. Nothing else could wash away your sin. Not baptism. Not any good work that you would do. It's only through Christ's blood. And you know, every Sunday, we recite the second half of verse 22 of this chapter. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. We recite those verses on purpose, by the way. If you haven't figured that out, that was a, a plan. And the plan was to get you acquainted with these verses in a way that you wouldn't feel like you were being pressured to learn 11 great verses of the New Testament. And that's one of the truths that we wanted to emphasize. That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. Every Sunday morning, when we stand and recite those from the hymnal cover, that's one of the verses that we always uh, reinforce. Because it's important. All those 11 verses are important. Some of you, I've noticed, can leave your hymn book down and recite them looking at me without looking down at your Bible. And that's wonderful. And that's what we want to accomplish. When I could look out and see a lot of people reciting without looking down, I say, well, we've accomplished what we wanted to do. They have learned these verses and feel comfortable to stand there and recite them. And that's what it's all about. Recite them. Learn them. Memorize them. And you'll be able to share them uh, with others. Well, what is uh, water baptism all about? Well, we know certainly it doesn't save and it is uh, not a means of salvation. Let's look at a couple more baptisms here while we're at it. Uh, if you'll go to Matthew chapter... Let me see what it is. Chapter 20, I believe it is. We have another baptism that doesn't involve water or any other liquid. And it's... Uh, in chapter 20 here, we have verse 20, a mother getting involved. You know, women, mothers, like to make sure their sons are well treated and get the best uh, of whatever can be had for them. So we find here in verse 20, the story opens up here in Matthew chapter 20. Then came to Jesus the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. James and John, and here's Mama. Okay. Worshiping Christ, which was a good thing, but she had a special request that she wanted to have Christ answer for her sons. He said unto her, What wilt thou? What is your request? This is the mother of James and John to the apostles. She saith unto him, I'm not asking a whole lot, but grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on your right hand and the other on your left hand in your kingdom. I want them to have the highest positions available. I'm not asking for a whole lot. They're good boys. They've been hanging out with you now for a while. And they deserve, they deserve it. You know, Boy, isn't that... Can't you just imagine a mother doing that? I can. Well, anyway, here's what she says. Grant that these two, my two sons may sit the one at your right hand, the other in your left hand, in thy kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. 
Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. And I don't think they realize what they were saying they were able to do here. Verse 23 says, He said unto them, You shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And so we find here that uh, he said, I can't offer that to them, but you will be baptized. That baptism was the baptism of death. Christ was taken and violently killed. Uh, the crucifixion wasn't a nice execution. I mean, it was done with uh, violence. Perhaps the movie, uh, The Passion, showed you how violent it was. And I don't think we can ever really fully comprehend how violent it was when the soldiers uh, didn't treat Christ real nicely. They were slapping him around and hitting him with their fist and spitting on him and everything else. And then they took those hammers and drove those spikes through his hands and through his feet. It certainly was not a very nice occasion and it was a very bloody experience. And what he's saying is that these two boys would be martyred. Uh, the baptism of death, to fully experience uh, a horrible, violent death, which both James and John later did. It's told to us that John, by tradition, was actually boiled alive in a pot of uh, boiling oil on the island of Patmos. Well, we don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't record their exact means of death, but we're told that that's how he died. Can you imagine being thrown alive into a pot of boiling oil? Uh, awful, painful experience. Well, the two boys got that as uh, maybe as a result of this request. But that is another baptism, isn't it? The baptism of death. You don't hear many people preach on it or talk about it. But Christ, obviously, uh, was uh, caught up in this uh, thing of crucifixion. He became a victim and became uh, violently taken and killed in that awful way and fully experienced every moment of it and the pain and all of that went with his baptism. He experienced it and they also got to experience that which is called the baptism of death. Notice the other disciples. They weren't too happy with what this mother had done Verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. Well, when the other ten said, your mother did what? She asked for what? Uh, they weren't too pleased. They were um, indignant and they were angry with the other disciples, uh, the two that were, had been, uh, their mother asked for that request. Another baptism. Let's go over to uh, 1 Corinthians now. And here we have Another baptism mentioned, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, page 1220. It says here, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant that how all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now that is the baptism of Moses. Now, none of us can experience that. You'd have to be there at the edge of the Red Sea and cross over with Moses. But, you know, they were totally enclosed. There was the wall of water to the right and the wall of water to the left. And above them, the cloud in which God himself was going across over them with them. And they were completely immersed in this uh, cloud as Christ brought them across through the Red Sea on dry ground. So they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so here is another baptism. Nobody talks much about the baptism of Moses, but everybody that crossed out of Egypt into the promised land was delivered from Egypt. Their redemption was purchased by blood. The Passover lamb pictured the blood that was to be shed by a lamb, a picture of Christ shedding his blood. And you'll notice the one who led them that they were following was Christ. It says they did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was 
Christ. If you haven't marked that in your Bible, isn't that amazing? Christ in the Old Testament, again? It's everywhere. And so notice, uh, they... Uh, Notice we're eating and drinking of that spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness, but they all came out of Egypt alive. They experienced redemption, but the Christian life many of them failed in, and God allowed them to perish in the wilderness. But their salvation was intact. Let's go now to Acts chapter 8, and here we have the one account that really is quite clear as to what believers baptism is all about and as I've thought about it it really has the minimum number involved in a baptism we have Philip who leads the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ and the Ethiopian eunuch no others and so It'd be awful if you had to say, well, I can't be baptized because there's only one guy to be baptized. Jesus gave an illustration here so one person could be baptized. You know, if in the illustration he baptized three, we'd always say, sorry, we had to wait for two more. We can't baptize you unless there's a minimum of three. I'm sure that's what would happen, wouldn't it? I think so. People would do that. But I love the way the scriptures are written. And they're not written by accident the way they're written. I think this is God preparing us so that anyone who wants to give testimony in this way by baptism, it only requires one who wants to be baptized. I told that the other day. Somebody in New York, she says, I've been listening to your radio program and I want to be baptized. I don't have a clue of a church up here that I'd want to be baptized in because I'm having difficulty finding a sound Bible church. And I said, well, if you ever get to Florida, I'd be happy to do it. She says, I'm coming. I don't know when, but she's, I said, let me know, and we'll, we'll set it up so that maybe others can be baptized with you. But it wouldn't require more than just one person. And I said, if you can't find a place and you want to come to Florida with your family, I'll be glad to baptize you. And uh, she says, I'm coming. I don't know when, but I'm, gonna, I'm coming. So she wants to get baptized and will be baptized here. But that's a problem for some people because maybe their church practice practices sprinkling. Or maybe they don't practice baptism at all. Or maybe their doctrine is so totally wrong they tell you that it's essential for your salvation or other problems. And so sometimes I guess you need to find a genuine believer who would be willing to baptize you. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 8 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. I'm sure you've read about Gaza on the news in the last couple of years. We've seen how that Israel's given Gaza back over to uh, the Palestinians and uh, what has happened there. And it says here, which is desert, and it really is. It's just desert down by the Mediterranean Sea where Gaza is. It's not the place I would choose to live. Uh, it's hot and dry and uh, desert. It's not a pretty place. But it was on the way from Jerusalem down to Egypt or down to uh, Africa. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasure, he'd come to Jerusalem to, to worship. So here was a man from Africa, he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning back home to Ethiopia. And notice he was sitting in his chariot, and he was reading from Isaiah. He had a copy of the book of Isaiah in his lap, and he's reading from Isaiah. The Lord tells Philip, go, unto, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran over there to that chariot and heard him reading, apparently out loud, from the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you understand what you're reading? And notice the answer. He said, how can I, except some men should guide me? And he invited Philip. He would come up and sit with him in his chariot. So Philip gets up into the chariot, and they both are now taking a look at Isaiah. <coughs> it says here, excuse me, in verse uh, 32, the place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, 
And like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. That's about Christ. In Isaiah chapter 53, 700 and something years before Christ ever came the first time, the story of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is all foretold. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture, and what? Preached unto him Jesus. He said, this is talking about Christ. And shared the story of the gospel with this man. And uh, then notice it says here, as they were moving along the way in the chariot, they came near a certain body of water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What is now preventing me from being baptized? And Philip said in verse 37, If you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. And he said here, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so here is the only requirement to be water baptized, is to be testifying that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Son of God, who died for you. And so here he had believed or trusted on Christ as his Savior. And Philip, it says here, and uh, rather he, the eunuch, commanded the chariot to stand still. They both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. So here you see it's clearly not sprinkling. They both walked down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And notice it most likely was immersion, which we believe it was. And when they were come up out of the water, uh, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. If you have the NIV, which I don't recommend for anybody, verse 36 here, yeah, verse 37 rather is gone. If you have an NIV, it's one of 44 verses that are absolutely gone from your Bible. You'll read in an NIV, verse 36, you'll read verse 38, but there is no verse 37. That has caught a lot of people's attention when I bring that up to them and they say, whoa, it's the most important verse here. It tells really what the requirement was for the Ethiopian eunuch to be baptized was, and that was that he would believe, and that he did believe and confess that, and as a result he was water baptized. But the NIV is not a good translation at all, and it's one of the reasons why you ought to get rid of it if you, if you haven't. And there are whole churches that that's all they use, is the NIV. You know, I have people tell me all the time, everybody in our church uses the NIV, the preacher uses it, and so on. Man alive, they're getting cheated, number one, and probably being misled, uh, number two, because uh, it also changes the meaning in many other places. This is what we do right here. The Ethiopian eunuch is the classic example of believer's baptism. When you trust Christ and you come to know that you are saved through his death and shed blood, then uh, as an open public testimonial, as Christ has asked us to do, you are water baptized to proclaim that you're cleansed of your sin, not by the water, but by the blood of Christ. You're washed of your sin by his blood, but you testify by being water baptized, which is a ceremony or a picture of what Christ did. And uh, every believer ought to be water baptized. If you haven't, you ought to be. And we baptized some people here in this congregation that are up there in years, so it's not just for the young people, it's for anybody who has not been water baptized since they have been saved. I know we baptized Al and his wife uh, a year or two ago. You were about how old when we were baptized? I think I was about 76. 76 when we got baptized. And so, uh, obviously, uh, anybody here 76 or younger have no excuse. Right, uh, And if you're 76 and older, you don't have an excuse, really, you don't. And uh, we, uh, obviously, when we do it, we make you feel very comfortable about it, and everybody uh, uh, really says, wow, I just didn't realize it was that, that simple. And uh, yet it's a beautiful picture to be remembered uh, the rest of your life. Water doesn't save, but it is a command of Christ. We're going to go to one last verse because of the time, but if you go to Matthew 28, notice this great verse at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And here this is a verse that gives us the 
part two of the Great Commission. This is page 1044, Matthew chapter 28. It says here in verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto his disciples and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. If you have a Schofield, notice in the margin that word teach should read disciple. This is phase two. We are to go with the gospel and have people become saved or believers. When you believe or trust on Christ, you become saved. But then you're to take people that you've gotten saved and teach them, which is a part of discipleship. You disciple them. Notice in the margin it says disciple. And you are to disciple all nations. So we not only get people saved, but we're also to make disciples of them. And notice to... Uh, who are we to baptize? It says, baptizing them. So I think that baptism is not necessarily grabbing somebody who's just got saved uh, and baptizing them, although in the case of the Ethiopian eunuch, he was baptized immediately, uh, right there on the way. But it's also someone who I think is giving testimony and now is marking the beginning of their becoming a disciple of Christ, which we don't do to become saved, but we do because we are saved. So baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded you. And so we're to teach people after we become saved, and we, like there's a beginning point when you decide you want to do that, and you're baptized, you're giving testimony, you're coming out of the closet, you're letting people know you're a believer, and now you want to grow and are now taught. And notice it says here, baptizing them in the name of and notice it's singular of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, all three members of the God have, have the same name. There's only one God. It doesn't say names, but names singular of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We find that God the Father is Yahweh. And God the Son is Yahweh or Jehovah. And God the Holy Spirit is Yahweh or Jehovah. They all have the same name. And Jesus, of course, takes upon himself that name Yahweh and Yasha, which the contraction of which is Yeshua. In English, it's Jesus. So it's the God who would save you, the God who would take on human flesh. So in any case, uh, I hope if you've not been water baptized, you'd consider getting that done. As a believer, every believer ought to do it. My mom tells me I was sprinkled as a child I don't remember a thing about it. I just had to take my word, mother's word for that, that it happened. But again, it's not scriptural. There's nothing in the Bible about baptizing an infant at all. It's always of someone who has come of age to have trusted Christ and now wants to give testimony to the fact that they have by water. And water baptism was a picture of that. And so with that, we're going to wind it up here today. I have... Uh, a clean piece of paper here I'm going to use, and I'm uh, going to use this uh, hymnal to uh, represent sin. Watch this, and we'll quit. This hand represents everybody here. The hymnal represents our sin, and the fact that we're all sinners. I placed it on my hand to illustrate the fact that we're all sinners. To go to heaven, no sin can enter heaven. So how do we get rid of our sin to be able to enter heaven? The answer is there's nothing we can do except go to hell. What we need is a Savior. My other hand representing Christ, he is that Savior. This clean piece of paper representing his righteousness. All of your sins and mine, and everyone who's ever lived, has been taken by God and laid upon Christ, and he paid for them. When you trust that he made that payment for you at the cross, then God exchanges for your sin and credits you with his righteousness. So the believer in Christ is seen righteous, based on the fact that God has taken your sin and made a payment for it on the cross. All of your sin, past, present, and future. And when you trust that he did that for you, then God looks down upon you and sees you as though you'd never sinned. As though you were as righteous as God. We're justified, the Bible says. And some people recommend you learn the word justified, what it means by saying, just as if I had never sinned. Justified. Declared righteous is what the real meaning is, but it's just as if 
I had never sinned. Justified. Just as if I had never sinned. God sees you righteous. Justified. If you trust Christ as Savior. And of course, water baptism is symbolic and is a picture of that. And an obedient Christian will want to be water baptized once after they've been saved and will want to observe the Lord's Supper as often as it's offered. And uh, those are things that Christ is not a whole lot of things to follow or do, uh, but that's uh, two that he's left to us to do. Let's bow in prayer and we'll quit. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, and with no one looking around, if you came today and did not know where you would spend eternity, chances are maybe you never heard or understood the plan of salvation until now. And so this is an opportunity for you to trust the Lord. You that are watching on the internet right now, from wherever you might be watching in the world, uh, this is for you too. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us are headed for hell. Unless we have a Savior, Jesus Christ is that Savior. And when you trust that He died for you and was buried and rose again from the dead, that His death and shed blood was the means by which your salvation was purchased, and you put your trust in Him, then you become cleansed of your sin, you become a child of God. I hope everyone here has done that. But if you haven't, would you whisper a prayer right now and just say, God, I don't understand a whole lot, but I do believe Jesus died for me. I trust right now that Christ paid my sin debt in full, and by His death and shed blood paid for my sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead. I trust Jesus right now to save me, to forgive me, to give me the gift of eternal life. The moment you do, God up in heaven saves you. You don't have to look for a feeling. If you're looking for a feeling, you'll be disappointed because we're never promised one. And feelings, by the way, are misleading. <coughs> you may feel saved one day and not feel the next. You may not feel saved the next day. But you know, God's word never changes. If God said it and you believe it, that settles it. You can go back to the Bible and read it again and again and again and again. He's not going to change what he's written. And if you trust Christ, he says he would save you, forgive you, become a child in his family. Whisper that prayer right now. Lord, I'm a sinner, but I trust Jesus Christ right now as the one who paid for my sin, was buried, and rose again from the dead. I trust him right now to be my Savior. Now, if you just did that this morning, while no one's looking, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, we're doing it this way on purpose so you'll not be put on the spot. We're not going to have anybody forward. No one's going to come running up and grab you by the shoulder. No one will even know. No one's looking except for me. And so while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed this prayer, I'm going to ask you to just lift up your hand and put it up and down, and I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. Yes. Anybody else? I trusted Christ. God bless you. Yes. You can put them down. Anybody else? I trusted Christ as my Savior today. I'd like you to know. I'd like you to pray for me. Slip up your hand. Let me see. Put it back down, and we're going to close. And just a moment. Anyone else? I trusted Christ as Savior right here today. Pray for me. Slip it up and put it down. Anybody else? All right. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these two that by the hand have indicated they trusted you as their Savior. And how wonderful that is. We're excited for them. And we pray that you'd give them real assurance, letting them see that right there in the Bible, they can see it for themselves, that whosoever believeth in Christ uh, would not perish because you perished in their place, but have everlasting life. And I uh, pray that every one of us here might recognize that we, now that we are saved, if we have trusted you as Savior, are saved forever, we'll never be cast out or lost, but now we should be really getting answers so we can lead others to Christ and tell them this wonderful story. And we pray that we might always come with our Bible and come with a pen and take notes and prepare ourselves to be able to give an answer to somebody else. And we pray that hopefully the series that we've been doing here on baptism might have uh, opened our eyes to the different kinds of baptisms taught and how that the one thing that we need to be, do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we will be saved, to trust Him as our Savior. Lord, again, bless these that just now trusted you as Savior. Give us a great fall as we now enter into this month of September. We know, Lord, that should you come on the Feast of Trumpets this year, we've got just one more Sunday, and we'll be out of here. And uh, we know that uh, we want to do the best job we can do in the remaining days that we might have left. Or if you don't come this year, maybe the next year might be all that we have. We don't know uh, whether this year or next year or the year after or 
how many years we have to wait, but we do know that we should be living in that expectancy and pray that you would really abundantly bless. We ask you to bless everyone that came today and thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, next Sunday we're going to try this 9 o'clock special rapture seminar on the internet with active interaction. You'll This is an experiment. I'm going to be learning myself. But we'll have people giving questions over the internet. I'll be answering. They'll be able to watch me anywhere in the world. You can tell your friends to tune in. We're hoping to build a larger Sunday morning worship service audience out of it as well. At the end of the 10 o'clock, we'll loop it, and it'll play again for people to watch it a second time. And that means if they're sitting there, you know, they got something they're watching, and they can, at 11 o'clock, catch our morning worship service. We're guessing that we have over 200 watching us every Sunday morning. That's interesting, isn't it? Amazing that we have an audience that's out there that's loyal watching every Sunday. And I pray for that. It might continue to grow.